Does the Bible teach that Yeshua, Jesus, is divine? Philippians 2, 5-11 is a central text that speaks to this question. In this passage, Paul teaches that the Messiah existed as a divine figure prior to his human conception, he bears the divine name Yahweh, and is rightfully given the reverence and allegiance that belong to Yahweh alone. In this video, we will examine Philippians 2, 5-11 in depth to establish each of these points. We will also address the arguments of those who say that this text refers only to Yeshua's humanity and says nothing about his pre-existence or divinity. The Bible repeatedly stresses that believers are to be humble. In fact, the scriptures declare that God gives grace to the humble but opposes the proud. That is, God opposes those who are not humble. So if we don't want God to oppose us, we must be humble. But why do the scriptures put so much focus on this virtue? Well, one reason is that humility is a necessary ingredient to having unity among believers. That is Paul's point in his epistle to the Philippians. Paul and encourages his readers to be united in striving side by side for the gospel, which requires humility and self-sacrifice. Philippians 2 verses 3 through 4, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. According to Paul, being humble means treating other people as more important than ourselves. It means sacrificing our own priorities and ambitions to serve others. Now, in light of Paul's exhortation for believers to consider other people as more important, the objection might be raised, but aren't we all humans and therefore equal? It isn't fair that I should have to treat another human as more important than myself. Anticipating this objection, Paul goes on to give the greatest example of someone who did precisely what he is instructing his readers to do. Paul points to the Messiah who treated his equal as more important than himself. The Messiah, the Word who was with God in the beginning and is God, willfully became human and humbled himself to serve his father's interests. Paul says that we are to have this same mind or attitude. That is, Yeshua serves as our example of why we are to consider our equals as more important than ourselves and to look to their interests. Here's how Paul describes the Messiah's example of humility. Philippians 2 verses 5 through 8, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. There is much to unpack in this passage. For instance, what does it mean that the Messiah was in the form of God? And what does it mean that the Messiah did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped? We will explore both of these concepts in detail. The form of God. In Greek, the word for form is morphe, which generally refers to visible appearance. We can see this basic sense of the term in Mark 16, 12, where the resurrected Messiah visibly appeared in another form to two of his disciples. How do we understand Yeshua as being in the morphe, or visible appearance of God? Many scholars have argued that we should understand this term against the backdrop of biblical and extra-biblical descriptions of the visible manifestation manifestations of God's glory. For example, Ezekiel speaks of the heavens opening and seeing the appearance of a man seated on a throne. Ezekiel refers to this figure as the glory of Yahweh. In 1 Enoch 14.20, the author identifies the figure seated on the heavenly throne as the great glory. For a Jew like Paul, then, saying that the Messiah existed in the form of God means that the Messiah had an appearance of divine glory before taking upon himself the form of a servant. Early Greek texts that associate divine glory with Morphe confirm this connection between the glory of Yahweh and the form of God. For example, in his account of Moses' encounter with the burning bush, Philo uses the term Morphe to describe the visible manifestation of God's presence in the burning bush, which he calls a, quote, very beautiful form, Morphe, a most godlike image, which anyone might have imagined to be the image of the living 
seeking God. Philo settles on calling this glorious form that Moses saw an angel. Nevertheless, for Philo, this visible form could easily be thought of as the glorious appearance of God himself. Additionally, Justin Martyr directly links God's glory with his morphe, his form. In light of these connections, scholar Joseph Hellerman concludes, quote, given A, that morphe means most basically visible appearance, and B, that God's visible appearance is so widely framed in terms of his glory, it would seem self-evident that morphe theo, or visible appearance of God in Philippians 2.6, ought to be taken to refer in some sense to the glory of God. The idea of Yeshua being in the morphe, or visible appearance of God, is significant to Paul's argument in Philippians. In ancient Roman culture, one's visible appearance was closely associated with one's social status. For instance, Roman senators wore a special badge on their togas called the latus clavus. An ancient inscription from Philippi describes how the emperor exalted someone to the senatorial order by stating that he had received the honor of the latus clavus. So then, for Paul and his original readers, the form of God would convey the idea that Yeshua had a glorious appearance and divine status in heaven. As Peter O'Brien writes, quote, the picture of the pre-existent Christ clothed in the garments of divine majesty and splendor could be said to make adequate sense of the phrase. The rest of the passage confirms that Paul's use of morphe here is connected to this idea of status. Paul will go on to say that Yeshua took on the form, morphe, of a servant, which is further defined as being born in the likeness of men. In other words, Yeshua surrendered his high status in heaven and took upon himself the lowly status of a human being on earth to serve the Father's interests. In the next chapter of Philippians, Paul points to himself as another example of this same principle. He was regarded as a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee. Yet, he says he counted his high status in society as filth and chose instead to become a servant and share in Messiah's sufferings. One can see how this illustration fits well with Paul's instruction to his readers. Paul says to do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. In other words, stop caring so much about your own status and priorities, and instead treat others as more important than yourself and consider their interests. Put aside your special privileges as a Roman citizen and adopt the attitude of a citizen of heaven. After all, Yeshua was in the form of God. He had the highest and most glorious status that one could have, and yet Yeshua surrendered his high position in heaven to take upon himself the appearance and status of a slave, a human being on earth. Before we move on, there is one more point worth mentioning about the term morphe in connection with the concept of a divine figure becoming a man. Paul's description of Messiah existing in the form of God and taking upon himself the form of a slave by being born in the likeness of men bears a striking resemblance to the god Dionysus' speech in Euripides' Bacchae. In his speech, Dionysus states that he has, quote, exchanged his divine form, Morphe, for a mortal one, and that he has, quote, taken on mortal form, Morphe, and changed his appearance to that of a man. Notice that both Paul and Euripides use the term Morphe to describe this concept of exchanging form. Paul's readers in Philippi, a city where Dionysus worship was prevalent in the mid-first century, would have been familiar with Euripides' Bacchae due to its widespread popularity and importance in Greek education. Thus, it seems reasonable to expect that Paul's readers would have recognized the similarities between Paul's descriptions of Messiah's incarnation and Dionysus' transformation into human form. As he does elsewhere, Paul is using material that would have been familiar to his Greek audience to explain the truth about a hard concept. He uses this unique vocabulary that we find in the Bacchae to help his readers grasp the idea of Yeshua being a divine figure who takes on the form of a man, as Eliezer Gonzalez writes. Quote, this is only natural in the sense that although Paul's concepts are fundamentally Jewish, he is writing to an audience in a Gentile city and context. Of course, the analogy to Dionysus is not perfect. In contrast to Dionysus, Yeshua does not merely take on the appearance of a man, he actually becomes a man. Nevertheless, Paul's allusion to Dionysus serves to help his Greek readers understand the reality of the divine pre-existent Messiah being born in the likeness of men.
men. In summary, Yeshua being in the form of God prior to taking on the form of a servant indicates his pre-existence and divinity. The Bible and extra-biblical Jewish literature associate God's visible appearance, his form, with his glory. Passages from Greek literature substantiate this association by using the term morphe in connection with divine glory. Culturally, visible appearance was also connected to social status in ancient Roman society, indicating Messiah's high position in heaven before he took on the lowly status of a slave by being born on earth. Additionally, Paul's characterization of the Messiah exchanging his form of God for the form of a servant has intertextual echoes with Euripides' Bacchae, which uses the same term Morphe to describe a divine figure taking on the form of a man. This popular play was known to Paul's readers, and it is reasonable to expect that Paul might borrow vocabulary from this material to explain to his audience how Yeshua could pre-exist as a divine figure before becoming a man. Thus, to say that Yeshua existed in the form of God is to say that Yeshua existed as a divine figure prior to his human conception. A thing to be grasped. How should we understand Paul's statement that Yeshua, quote, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped? In Greek, the word translated as a thing to be grasped is harpagmas, which means robbery. As an abstract noun, harpagmas can also have the sense of something valuable, worth grasping. Some suggest that Paul's use of harpagmas here means Yeshua lacked equality with God and refused to grasp at it. However, it is more likely that Yeshua already had equality with God and did not count it as something to be grasped, that is, held on to. Two reasons can be given to support this fact. First, the definite article in the phrase, literally the being equal with God, is anaphoric, meaning it refers back to the previous phrase, form of God. This suggests a connection between the two phrases. Second, the parallelism in verses 6 through 7 further supports this connection. In verse 6, the phrase equality with God immediately immediately follows form of God, and in verse 7, the phrase human likeness follows form of a slave. The phrase human likeness in verse 7 serves to interpret the preceding phrase form of a slave, indicating that the phrase equality with God in verse 6 is intended to interpret form of God. These grammatical features suggest that the two phrases are roughly equivalent, which would entail that Yeshua already possessed equality with God by virtue of existing in the form of God. As Gordon Fee observes, quote, Paul intends the infinitive phrase to be equal with God to repeat in essence the sense of what preceded, being in the form of God. Additionally, the entire expression is likely idiomatic. When Paul writes that the Messiah, quote, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, he probably means to say that the Messiah did not consider his equality with God something to exploit or use for his own advantage. Grammatically, this this expression is known as an object complement construction. Elsewhere in Greek literature, when the word harpagmas, or its synonym, is used as part of this grammatical construction, where the verb is something like consider or regard, exactly like what we have in Philippians 2.6, it is always meant idiomatically in the sense of an advantage to exploit. For example, consider this passage from Heliodorus, quote, a young man so handsome and in his prime thrusts away a young woman of similar similar qualities who yearns for him, and does not regard the matter as harpagma. Here, the handsome young man rejects the advances of a beautiful woman. The person speaking in this passage is astonished that this man does not regard the matter as harpagma, that is, that the man refuses to use the situation to his own advantage. Based on this and other examples of this construction in Greek literature, Roy Hoover explains that Philippians 2.6 is best translated as he did not regard being equal with God as something to use for his own advantage. As Hoover writes, quote, In every instance which I have examined, this idiomatic expression refers to something already present and at one's disposal. The question in such instances is not whether or not one possesses something, but whether or not one chooses to exploit something. Thus, according to this idiomatic reading, Yeshua was in the form of God and had equality with God, and yet he refused to use this divine status 
as something for his own advantage. Instead, Paul says that Yeshua emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. What does Paul mean when he says that the Messiah emptied himself? As Paul Holloway points out, the verb emptied himself refers back to the noun empty conceit in verse 3, just as humbled himself refers back to humility and becoming obedient foreshadows obeyed. In light of these language choices, Holloway observes, quote, Paul chose the expression to produce a meaningful wordplay. Rather than displaying empty conceit, Christ emptied himself. The point is that rather than use his equality with God for his own advantage, the Messiah set aside his glorious appearance and status in heaven and took upon himself the appearance and status of a slave on earth. Now, Yeshua did not literally become a slave in the Roman social order. Rather, as Michael Byrd and Nijay Gupta explain, quote, it appears that Paul was trying to communicate here that the great distance that Christ moved from high glory to lowly mortal existence is like a king becoming a slave. This is a word picture representing Christ's deep humility and absolute concern for obedience to God and love of others. Indeed, Yeshua relinquishing his glorious heavenly status to be born on earth as a man is like a king becoming a slave. Yeshua surrendered all privileges associated with having equality with God in order to serve the Father's interests on earth. Paul says that Yeshua did this by being born in the likeness of men. In other words, the way that Yeshua emptied himself and took on the appearance and status of a slave was by becoming a man and then living a life of complete obedience to the Father's will. The fact that Yeshua already had equality with God and chose not to use it for his own advantage fits the pattern that we see elsewhere in Philippians. For instance, in Philippians 3, 4 through 11, Paul also talks about his own high status as a Pharisee and a Hebrew of Hebrews. Like Yeshua, Paul chose not to use this high status that he already possessed to his own advantage. Paul was not grasping at a status he did not already have. He chose not to exploit what he had. Before we move on, the word likeness should not be thought to imply that Yeshua was not actually human. Paul uses this precise language intentionally to attempt to express the paradoxical notion that while Yeshua was fully human, he did not stop being divine. Paul uses the same word in Romans 8.3 to say that Yeshua came in the likeness of sinful flesh. This expression does not mean that Yeshua did not actually have flesh. In Romans, Paul's point is that Yeshua was similar to sinful humans, but also different. The difference is that Yeshua's sinful flesh, unlike ours, was unsuccessful in causing him to sin. Hence, he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Similarly, although Yeshua was fully human, he was also divine. Hence, he was born in the likeness of men. Unitarian Objections to Messiah's Pre-Existence Addressed before we continue to verses 9 through 11, it is worth addressing the alternative perspective on this passage. Unitarians do not believe that the Messiah existed prior to his human conception. Thus, they have to provide a different reading of Philippians 2, 6 through 8 to avoid that conclusion. However, as we will see, the Unitarian approach to this passage lacks textual support and is frankly contrived. Many Unitarians view this passage through the lens of Adam Christology. They take take Messiah being in the form of God as another way of saying that he was in the image of God. Like Adam, Yeshua was a mere human made in God's image. But unlike Adam, who tried to seize equality with God by eating from the tree of knowledge, the Messiah did not grasp at equality with God. In other words, according to many Unitarians, being in the form of God refers to Yeshua's humanity. Yeshua's humble refusal to try to seize equality with God during his earthly life Life was rewarded with exaltation. There are several problems with this proposal. First, this view assumes that the phrase, quote, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, means that Yeshua lacked equality with God and refused to grasp at it. However, as we have seen, the grammar and parallelisms in the text show that equality with God interprets form of God, which means that equality with God was something the Messiah already had by virtue of him 
existing in the form of God. Also, we have seen that the entire expression is likely idiomatic and means did not count equality with God something to use for his own advantage. Second, this interpretation has no linguistic basis in the text. Greek literature never uses the term morphe for humanity being in God's image. Instead, the word used for this concept in the Septuagint and New Testament is always icon. So, although one might argue for an allusion to the image of God in theory, there is simply nothing explicit in the text itself that suggests such a connection. If Paul meant to describe the image of God, why would he not use the word that he always uses elsewhere for this concept? Why would he use a completely different word that is never used by him or anyone else for this concept, and that nobody would have recognized as having any connection whatsoever to the Genesis narrative? Third, this interpretation just seems forced. For instance, Genesis says that Adam and Eve became like God, specifically in regard to knowing good and evil, not equal to God. Moreover, the Septuagint uses a completely different word to describe this. The Septuagint uses hos, like, while Paul uses isos, equality. According to Gordon Fee, to make the analogy with Adam work, the language and grammar of Philippians 2, quote, must be stretched nearly beyond recognition. For these and other reasons, we can reasonably dismiss the idea idea that Paul alludes to Adam in Philippians 2.6, and that form of God means being made in God's image, i.e. being human. Now, not all Unitarians rely on a supposed allusion to Adam in their interpretation, but all still maintain that the Messiah did not exist prior to his human conception, and seek other ways to reinterpret Philippians 2.5-8 as only referring to Yeshua's earthly life. Nevertheless, the efforts made by Unitarians to read this text in a way that denies Messiah's divinity and pre-existence involve a great deal of hermeneutical gymnastics. For instance, if Paul wanted to communicate that Yeshua was always and only a mere human, why would he describe this idea in such a confusing way? Why would he contrast being born in the likeness of men with being in the form of God if these statements mean the same thing? Would this not essentially be like saying that the Messiah, who was already human, became a human? One proposal opponent of Unitarianism suggests that form of God and equality with God refer merely to Yeshua's godly character as a man. However, that raises the issue of Yeshua emptying himself of his godly character. It also is unclear how Yeshua might exploit his godly character for his own advantage. As Marcus Bachmuel puts it, quote, this reading leads to logical contradictions and destroys the deliberate syntactical and theological contrast between verses 6 and 7. Seven. Additionally, the Unitarian interpretation, which rules out the possibility of Messiah's pre-existence, makes the passage awkward and disjointed. The text states that the Messiah exists in the form of God, and then takes upon himself the form of a servant. By taking the form of a servant, the Messiah acquired something he did not previously possess, meaning that there was a point in time prior to the Messiah taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. In order to dismiss Yeshua's pre-existence, Unitarians must reinterpret Yeshua's self-emptying as referring to an event in Yeshua's earthly life. But this breaks the natural progression of the text. Would it not make more sense to understand any events in Yeshua's earthly life as being described in verse 8? In being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. For these and other reasons, we can dismiss the Unitarian reinterpretations of this passage that try to deny Yeshua's divinity and pre-existence. Philippians 2, 6-8 teaches that Yeshua existed in the glorious form of God and had equality with God before his human conception. The Messiah is Yahweh. The Messiah exhibited great humility not only by surrendering his glorious status in heaven to become human, but also by humbly obeying the Father during his earthly life, even to the point of death on the cross. Yeshua's humble obedience resulted in his exaltation. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus 
Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Here, Paul says that Messiah's humility and obedience to the cross have resulted in him being highly exalted, that is, exalted to the highest place. All mankind bows before him and confesses that he is Lord. Now, since Yeshua already existed in the form of God and had equality with God prior to his incarnation, we should see this exaltation as God restoring Yeshua to the glorious appearance and status he previously had before becoming human. The difference is that now all creation fully acknowledges Yeshua's divine position, as Tim Hegg writes. It is not as though Yeshua is given an exaltation higher than he had in his pre-existent state, but that in his post-resurrection exaltation he is now seen for who he truly is and always has been, the one who reigns above all. Paul also states that the resurrected Messiah has been given the name that is above every name. What is this name? Well, some have suggested that it is simply Yeshua, Jesus, the name by which he was known during his time on earth. That understanding seems natural considering the next verse which reads, at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. However, one problem with this view is that the Messiah was already known by the name Yeshua or Jesus before his crucifixion and exaltation, whereas this new name was not given to Yeshua until after his death. As Dr. Pierre Bolte points out, quote, the errorist gives Given points at a specific moment at which the bestowal of the name took place, and that moment must have either coincided with or immediately followed upon Jesus' death. More likely, then, the phrase in the name of Jesus should be understood as the name that now belongs to Jesus. So then, if it's not Jesus, what then is this name above every name? Well, according to the context, the name to which Paul refers must be Lord, as we read in verse 11, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But what is so special about the name Lord? Well, the name Lord is special in this context because Lord, kurios, stands for Yahweh. When the New Testament authors quote passages from the Old Testament that reference Yahweh, they consistently use kurios, Lord, in place of the divine name. The New Testament authors followed the same practice we see in the Septuagint, which uses kurios in place of Yahweh around 6,000 times. Thus, by way of the Greek Greek Kyrios, Lord, standing in place for the divine name, the exalted Messiah is given the name Yahweh. From a Jewish perspective, Yahweh is indeed the name that is above every name. But how do we know that the Lord in verse 11 stands for Yahweh? Well, one reason is that Paul's language in this verse is directly taken from a passage in Isaiah about Yahweh. By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. According to Dr. Pierre Bolte, quote, the translation of these words in the LXX is remarkably equal to the phrase we find in Philippians. However, there is one important difference. In Isaiah 45, 23, the speaker is Yahweh. He says, to me, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. In Philippians 2, 10 through 11, however, these words are applied to Yeshua. Paul replaces the to me of Isaiah 45, 23, which refers to Yahweh, with in the name of Jesus. So every knee shall bow to Yeshua and every tongue will confess that Yeshua, Jesus, is Yahweh. Now, now, the fact that Yeshua is given the name Yahweh upon his exaltation does not imply that he was not divine prior to this point in time. Verse 6 is clear that Yeshua existed in divine glory and had equality with God before his incarnation. Rather, the giving of this new name, as seen elsewhere in the Bible, signifies a new phase or shift in the course of one's life. Yeshua has now reached the stage where he will be universally recognized as having all authority. The significant of Yeshua's identification as Yahweh cannot be overstated, as Richard Bauckham writes. In Jewish monotheism, the unique name of God, Yahweh, names his unique identity. It is exclusive to the one God in a way that the sometimes ambiguous word God is not. Hence, the bearing of this divine name by the exalted Jesus signifies unequivocally his inclusion in the unique divine identity, recognition of which is precisely what worship in the Jewish monotheistic tradition 
nation expresses. In addition to being identified by the name Yahweh, Yeshua is also the recipient of the worship and allegiance that Isaiah emphatically declares should be directed only toward Yahweh. Paul states that all who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth will bow to Yeshua and confess that he is Yahweh. This universal worship of Yeshua is a common theme expressed in early Christian writings. In Revelation 5, 13-14, John echoes Paul by declaring that every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea will worship the one who sits on the throne and the Lamb. Polycarp, a disciple of John, likewise writes, quote, Believing in the one who raised our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead and gave him glory and a throne at his right hand, to whom are subject all things heavenly and earthly, whom all that breathes worships, who is coming as the judge of the living and the dead. Significantly, the worship and allegiance given to Yeshua in his exaltation did not detract from the glory of the Father. On the contrary, bowing before Yeshua and confessing him to be Yahweh is done to the glory of God the Father. When we honor the Son, we are honoring the Father. The fact that the scriptures depict the Messiah being worshipped and glorified alongside the Father demonstrates that the earliest Christians did not see any conflict between monotheism, which they affirmed, and their confession that Yeshua is Yahweh. Elsewhere in the New Testament, worshipping anyone other than the God of Israel is strictly forbidden. The only way to resolve this tension is if the earliest Christians saw Yeshua as being included in the unique identity of the one God. The Father and the Son are both the one God, Yahweh. In conclusion, Paul admonishes believers to be humble and to count others as more important than themselves. Paul points to the Messiah as the perfect example of what that looks like. Yeshua existed in the glorious form of God and had equality with God in heaven prior to becoming human. The Messiah did not count his equality with God as something to use for his own advantage, but set aside his glorious appearance and status and took upon himself the appearance and status of a slave. He did this by being born as a human. As a human, Yeshua humbled himself and obeyed the Father even to the point of death on the cross. Because of his humility and obedience, the Messiah is highly exalted, given the name Yahweh, and receives the universal worship and allegiance that belong to Yahweh alone. Thus, Philippians 2, 5-11 affirms the Messiah's pre-existence and divinity. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you liked it. If you did like it, consider giving it a thumbs up and sharing your thoughts in the comments below. Also, if you want to see more content like this, I want to invite you to subscribe to my channel. You can also hit that little bell so that you'll be notified when new videos like this are released. I'll see you next time. Blessings and Shalom.